The subject of this is economic inequality. How many of you have uh, heard of this book, Capital by Thomas Piketty? So uh, this book uh, came out about a year and a half ago. It's been tremendously popular. Thomas Piketty is a French economist. He had never been heard of, well, I mean, he was not particularly famous in France before the book came out. Uh, and in fact, he's not that well regarded in France right now. But he skyrocketed to popularity in the United States and also in other countries. So he called this capital because uh, he wanted to do a takeoff on, of course, Marx's Das Kapital. Uh, and what he postulated was that when the rate of return of capital is greater than the growth rate of GDP, uh, you get more inequality. So uh, he, his ideal time, basically, uh, was in the 1950s, uh, when uh, the rate of uh, return on, uh, when, when inequality was decreasing. Uh, and what he says is that since the 1970s, there has been increasing inequality. And this is something that is gradually going to do away with our capitalist society. Inequality is going to increase to such an extent uh, that our democratic system of capitalism is going to collapse. So the solution is that the government has to increase taxes on wealth and have a global tax on capital in order to reduce this inequality. Well, naturally, when this book came out, uh, the left just took it and ran away with it. Here was their excuse for the taxation that they had been seeking, that if we don't have these radical taxes, then capitalism, which as we've seen before, has brought so many benefits, is going to just disappear. So today I'm going to talk about, first of all, what, whether what Piketty said was right, and if it's right, uh, what the solutions are, and if it's wrong, how we should better be looking at the issue. So first of all, I'm going to look at, has inequality increased? So what uh, Thomas Piketty says is that there has been a dramatic increase in inequality since the 1970s. And since the 1970s, uh, we have, uh, this is a period that many uh, people choose. This isn't actually the first time he said that. He's the author of a series of papers with his co-author, Emmanuel Saez. That's S-A-E-Z. So there are a series of papers by Piketty and Saez showing uh, this increase in inequality. But there's a number of reasons for the increase in inequality. And uh, one is uh, that uh, the measurement of income uh, in the United States changed in 1987. In 1986, actually, during my first time at the White House, President Reagan signed into law the Tax Reform Act of 1986. That brought the top tax rate down from 50% to 28%. Before that, uh, the top tax rate, 50%, had been above the corporate tax rate. So it was in everyone's interest to incorporate their businesses, because they would only be taxed at 35%. Then after the tax reform, it was in everyone's interest to be individuals, to file their taxes as individuals because the top tax rate was 28%. So what happened? What happened was that a lot of people just went from filing as corporations to filing as individuals. And a lot of income moved off the corporate tax uh, tax files, the corporate tax returns, to the individual tax returns. All of a sudden, hey presto, people looked a lot richer. And that is something uh, that has uh, resulted, contributed uh, 
to the increase in inequality? Well, uh, Thomas Piketty says that his book is a factual book. It's very, very heavy, very, very thick, and he says that uh, one reason is that he has put a lot of data in it. Uh, one thing that he does is, though, his definition of income, he measures income before taxes and transfers. He calls this market income. And the definition of income to measure inequality is very problematic. He's not the only one who uses this definition. Because if you're measuring inequality as market income, the income everyone earns before they pay the taxes and before they have the transfers back from the government, then it means you can never get rid of inequality. Because even by taxing people, market income uh, would remain uh, approximately the same. In other words, your income might go down because of lower economic activity, uh, but it wouldn't go down because the taxes have been taken out. And similarly, people at the bottom, they wouldn't gain uh, because the transfers in terms of additional housing support, food support, medical support, uh, they wouldn't be added uh, back in. Well, I'm not, uh, not sure how, uh, how well you can uh, see this, but um, apart from the problem uh, with the market income, there's also a problem when you measure taxes of the income quintiles not being all the same and having different characteristics. So if you, these are data taken from the Bureau of Labor Statistics uh, of the Department of Labor. But this is true of any other countries, all other countries. When you divide up the uh, income brackets, you don't get all the same characteristics. Not all income brackets are equal. So if you look at the number of people in each consumer unit, in the bottom 20%, you have 1.7 people in each consumer unit, which is approximately a household. If you look at the top quintile, the highest 20%, it's 3.2 people. Now, right away, you wouldn't expect to have the same earnings or earnings to have the same value in these two different quintiles. Because if you have fewer people in a particular household, you don't need as much money to keep them going. And the person who has actually written the most about this is the Nobel Prize winner that was announced on Monday, Angus Deaton, who's done a lot of work showing how income should match up, how different poverty and measure levels and measures of well-being are depending on how many people in the family. He's done a lot of important work and I recommend it to you, especially since he's won the, the Nobel Prize. The second line is earners. So you can see the lowest 20% has an average of half an owner uh, per household unit. The top one has two earners per household unit. Mm -hmm. So here right away we're, dif we're dealing with different <coughs> numbers of earners. And what happened, and I'll show you some more graphs on this later, what happened during the 1980s is that women moved into the workforce in record numbers. So there were more to earn a couples, and that's a characteristic of the top quintile. The middle quintile, the middle fifth, has about 1.3, somewhat over one earner per household. And if one really wanted any true equality or a more general form of inequality, better equality, one could pass a law saying that only one person in a household is allowed to work, and one person in every household had to work. That would lift the incomes of the bottom uh, quintile, and it would lower the incomes of the top. Well, interestingly enough, not everybody in the bottom quintile is poor. You always think about the bottom fifth, and you think, well, these are poor people. Well, look at the next line. Uh, the uh, homeowners, uh, the uh, homeowners 
uh, without a mortgage. The, first of all, 40% of people in the lowest fifth uh, own their home. 12% with a mortgage, but 28% without a mortgage. The bottom two fifths have the largest percent of people who own their homes without a mortgage. How could that be? They're supposed to be poor, and they own their homes outright. Well, this shows that these income measures, these inequality measures, they measure income, and they don't measure assets. So say, for example, that you're retired, and you live uh, in an apartment in Baka. You maybe don't have any income, but you have a very nice apartment uh, that you own. It doesn't mean because you don't have any income that you're poor. You might be drawing on savings. And in fact, the normal life cycle of individuals is to start off like you are, uh, poor, without any income, as students. In fact, some of you have debt. Then you have your first job, and maybe you're in uh, the first or the second quintile. Then maybe you get married, and then there's two people with incomes and you shoot all the way up to maybe the fourth or the fifth quintile. That's a matter of life cycle progression. It's not necessarily a social problem. Now, of course, there are some people in the bottom quintile who are poor, and we can see the largest percentage of renters is in the bottom quintile. But the bottom quintile generally has three groups of people in it. One group of people, such as yourselves, who have something called human capital. In other words, you have the possibility of earning money, but you're not earning it yet. Second, we have people who are poor, who do not have a lot of human capital, who don't have a lot of possibilities of earning income. We have people like the cleaners and the construction workers that we were talking about earlier. Third, uh, we have the people who have finished their earning cycle and they are living off their assets, but they don't have much income, and so they are also in these bottom one or two quintiles. That's because income distribution tables measure income. They do not measure wealth. Uh, they don't measure assets. Yes, we have a question over here. Yeah, it's more of a technical question. If you don't sure. own a house with mortgage or without mortgage, then how do you own it? Because it doesn't add up to 100%. Right, that's 39. What? The oh, I see. So it's not supposed to be a percentage of no, it's from the house owner. If you add the 39 to the 61, then you get 100. No, no, that I got, but I thought the. No, okay, all right, so you add the. Right. From within. Yeah. No, so you add the 12 to the 28, and you no, get the 39. And then you add the 39 to the 61. Yeah, that's right. Well, that's rounding error. As we heard before, you never believe all the numbers, and there's always a certain amount of rounding error. Thomas Piketty doesn't, doesn't mention that you move through uh, the income quintiles uh, as uh, you get uh, older, and he also doesn't mention the two earner couples. And I might be able to tell you that I knew this because I read the entire book. Well, I did read a large proportion of the book. But as a check, I also got an electronic copy of it. And the nice thing about an electronic copy is that you can do a search. And there's nothing about two earner or dual earner couples in there. He doesn't look on that as a factor. Well, this shows from 1971 uh, to 2011 uh, that there are more single women. Their uh, number of divorces has gone up. Uh, the number married has gone down. Never married has gone up. And uh, widowed actually has uh, gone down. Uh, the change in the demographics is also one reason uh, for the increase in inequality. Uh, the size of households has been shrinking. And when you get shrinking households, you get more inequality because you have more singles at the bottom. And singles tend to have lower incomes when it comes to households. So here's the share of households with one person. And again, this is data from uh, the Department of Labor and the Bureau of Labor Statistics. 
So the demographic changes that we've been seeing uh, when young people postpone uh, marriage, when people live on their own longer, that actually changes the distribution of income. When people actually live longer also, then you get more of these people who are living on their assets. And all of you know uh, grandmothers who are living uh, you know, until well into their 80s, sometimes in their 90s. And this is a wonderful thing. But according to many inequality measures, that makes our income distribution uh, more unequal. But this is not, I would say, uh, a social problem uh, that we should be worrying about. At the same time, uh, we can see here that the number of joint returns uh, to earner couples is increasing. Uh, so, for example, in 1969, 46% of joint of uh, tax returns had two filers in them, and it gradually rose until 1999. It got to 60%. And uh, it's, that is uh, probably the peak. I don't have data from that data source after that. Uh, but the more two earner couples there are, and also the more that women invest in education, the more women who have law degrees, uh, medical degrees, business degrees. It used to be back in the 1960s and 70s, women would just be teachers. So even though a woman had an income, it did not substantially affect inequality. When you get to the stage that more women are going into the professions and then they're meeting their future husbands there and you have what's called like person marrying like, uh, then you have more of an increase in income inequality. Now, no one wants to tell women uh, not to go to university. No one wants to tell them not to go to professional school. In fact, well, no one in this room. There are perhaps people in Israel who would say that, but they are not here in this room. Uh, but that, again, is a demographic change uh, that increases inequality. So we can see here that the, oh, question from Kyle, yes. Hi. Let me go back. More people were filing as a couple, or more single. Uh, there are more people who have, yeah, yes. How can you have more single women as a percentage of the population, and also like a higher rate of couples filing together? Because there used to be women who didn't work, and so they would file, but it would be a one and a couple. Do you see? Because if you have more women in the workplace then there are more two earner returns. Before, the couple would have filed, and it would have been two people, but not two earners, because there were more stay-at-home mothers. So that's how you can do that. Could it also be that, um, that among the increase in, in people in the U.S. Yes. Uh, that, uh, that these are generally in higher income brackets, these are generally more educated, higher income Right, they, yes, exactly. They are in higher income uh, brackets, and I do have a chart for that. Uh, yeah, yeah, and I think I have a chart for that too. And if I don't have it on here, then I also have it on my, on my material. But you find that the majority of people in the top income group, as we saw actually from our chart earlier, are two earner couples. So if you look at the top fifth, <coughs> the top fifth are two earner, have primarily on average two earners. The fourth 20% has on average 1.7, which means some, there are some two earner couples and some single earner couples. But if you're a two earner couple, you're almost automatically in the top fifth. You're automatically contributing to this income inequality that Thomas Piketty is talking about. And Thomas Piketty basically used US data. The tax systems in different countries are different. For example, in England, people only file as singles. So uh, the measurement is slightly different. Uh, but in, uh, in many countries, they file as households and also receive benefits as households. Is there also a ethnic breakout? 
Uh, there are there are ethnic breakouts. Yes, yes. I don't have them here, but the census data show uh, that a large part of the single earners, families headed by single women, especially, uh, tend to be in the lowest quintile. And the problem is uh, young women having babies before they're married without a good education, and then the baby prevents them uh, from going back and earning and getting better training. So it's a lose-lose situation. Uh, Ron Haskins of the Brookings Institution and many other people have uh, shown that if you just uh, graduate from high school and you get married before you have children, you're not going to be in the bottom fifth. There's very few two-parent families in the bottom fifth. So there's a lot of cultural factors in there. And that is something that is actually particularly difficult to fix. It's very difficult to fix bad habits. And it's very difficult to go against the culture. And when you have one set of children born to teenage mothers, they're not properly looked after. Uh, the next, their children also are liable to fall into the same trap. And these cultural problems are especially prevalent in the United States. And that's one reason why the United States has more income inequality uh, than other countries. So uh, this shows that median income has risen faster for two earner households. This is adjusted for inflation in 2011 dollars. So with one earner family, in 1991, on average, they earned about $40,000. 2011, they earned about $42,000. But the two earners went from about $69,000 in 1991 to about $81,000 in 2011. And that's, again, because of the investment of women in human capital. And the more women get educated, uh, the higher measured uh, inequality uh, that we see. But can, I, yeah. can, you, can you go back? Sure. And if he is, look, in 2001, he jumped to 43,000 in one income, and then it's, it stays pretty much the same in jobs. And then the same thing goes in the two of you. It appears that, it has, because everybody has been saying it before, if like out of day the, the real wage hasn't been increase and this is exactly what we showed, isn't it? Uh, what, it's, one, right, what it's showing is that the uh, median income, the middle income uh, for that family uh, has stayed about the same for a one earner family. Now there are families who, again uh, one reason this is misleading is that someone doesn't just stay in the median income. Uh, people start off young with very little money uh, and then they become a median earner. You might become, say, a median earner when you're maybe, let's say, 32. Uh, then you get to your peak earnings in your 50s and early 60s, uh, and then you retire. So what they're looking at is uh, one earner and the median income. So these stories about how people have not really improved, uh, you're not looking at one person stuck in one income class. You don't graduate from school or university or a professional school and then go in one income class and then stay there your whole life. You get a, a first job and then a second job and a third job. But uh, um, so, that's, the, so that's, really, that's really a very, very good question. If the median stays the same, like I, I, we don't have the data, but we assume that the range or the distribution yeah. stays fairly the same since the economy is grown somewhat yeah. in the past decade or even 15 years since the data and, yeah. and, and wage has wages didn't change so somebody's getting money somebody is <coughs> essentially well, it means that people who say start at the beginning and then keep going if they are unmarried if they just have one income then in real terms they have about the same income uh, as they did before but it doesn't mean that one person starts in 1991 and then has the same income for 2011 because with age people have different amounts of assets and money so the idea that there's one person who stays earning the same all, all the time because these are all averages they're all averages of large groups of people
Uh, well, we, I mentioned before about market income and about one kind of income, uh, about Piketty uh, talking about just market income, in other words, income before taxes and transfers. But there are professors who have looked at income distributions and changes in income, including taxes and transfers. These are very eminent economists, and I would recommend that you read them if you're interested in the subject. There's Bruce Meyer from the University of Chicago and his co-author James Sullivan from the University of Notre Dame. And there's Richard Berkhauser from Cornell University. And they have pioneered the studies of income distributions, taking out the taxes and adding back in the transfers. And they conclude from that that there is very, uh, there's much less income inequality. In fact, uh, that income inequality has not changed at all. So um, Richard Berkhauser says that uh, adding capital gains to that, which is the gains that people's assets that they haven't necessarily realized. In other words, they own more, they own stocks, but that's not reflected in income. So he concludes that the bottom fifth has gone up by 13%, the middle fifth by about 6%, and the top fifth has gone down by 5% between 1979 and 2007. If you take out the capital gains, the bottom has gone up by 31%, the middle by 34%, and the top up uh, by 54%. Everybody has gained, uh, but uh, without the capital gains, then the top uh, have gained more than the others. Another thing that uh, Bruce Meyer and James Sullivan have looked at is consumption inequality, which is the ratio of per person spending between the top and the bottom quintiles. When you think about inequality, you think about how much can people spend and not just how much do people earn, because really at the end of the day, if you're looking at measures of well-being, it's how much people can afford. And this is real expenditure per person, real spending per person, between the lowest 20% uh, and the highest 20%. And the little dots are the ratio of the top uh, to the bottom. And so you find it's about 2.4, 2.5% on a per person basis. And uh, I, I actually calculated these data from the Consumer Expenditure Survey, but Bruce Meyer and James Sullivan have their own calculations that reach approximately the same conclusions. You have to look at per person spending because as you recall, the number of people per household is different. If you have 1.7 people, in the bottom quintile and about over three people in the top quintile, then you can't just look at household income. You can't compare them directly. You need to divide them by the number of people in the household. Uh, and so that's what this <coughs> chart does. And it shows that the top quintile spends about two, point, about two and a half times per person what the bottom quintile spends. Uh, well, and uh, again, these calculations are not in the Piketty book. Uh, another thing that Thomas Piketty doesn't mention when he talks about inequality is he doesn't talk about philanthropy or charity. And again, you don't have to read the whole book to find this out. You can do a search on your electronic version and zero mention of that. He doesn't mention any of the benefits uh, generated by people such as Bill Gates who give immense amounts of money to charity or the Clintons with their Clinton Foundation uh, that fund health initiatives in Africa. These measures also don't account for the number of people who just move around in income groups. So there's data from the US Treasury and they show that uh, of the 3,869 3, people 
who have been in the top 400 taxpayers uh, in the years 1992 to 2009. Only 87 of these, only 87 appeared for 10 or more years. Everybody else just w went in and out of uh, the top 400. It's not a particularly stable group. Well, let's look at Piketty's solutions. Piketty proposes as a way of doing away with the supposed inequality that he's found a global wealth tax. That also has a number of problems. Problem number one is how do you measure wealth? It's relatively simple, not that simple because there's a gray economy and a black economy and an underground economy, but it's relatively simple to measure income. People file taxes, they have income tax returns. The OECD collects data on income by quintile for different groups. In the United States and presumably in other countries, we have samples of individual income tax data that we can look at. So we can do innumerable calculations with income and we are capable of taxing people based on their income. But what he's proposing is different, which is a global wealth tax. And wealth is a lot harder to calculate. With wealth, you need to look at not just your income, but also the value of your house, cars, boats, jewelry, other kinds of real estate, financial investments. And all of these are moving around at any particular given point in time. Your house might be worth one thing one year and another thing another year. If the stock market goes up and down, your stocks are worth one thing one day, another thing another day. These prices move a lot. So calculating people's wealth in oh, such a way that you can tax them on it is really a very, very difficult thing to do. Uh, if you uh, look, uh, also people don't like to reveal their wealth. There's a survey uh, done by the Federal Reserve called the Survey of Consumer Finances, and it purports to measure people's wealth. But if someone came to Larry, for example, and they said, Larry, what is your wealth? I'm from the government. I'm interested. I don't think Larry would necessarily either know, or if he does know, reveal his entire wealth to the government official who comes to ask. Let me check with my tax attorney. <laughs> He'd check with his tax attorney. His tax attorney would probably tell him not to answer. So people are not always honest when they reveal these things. Uh, Piketty also uh, says that, well, his fundamental equation, which is when the rate of return on capital is greater than the growth of GDP, it's also very difficult to measure the rate of return on capital. Because as we heard this morning from Dov Friedman, there isn't one rate of return on capital. There's treasury bonds that don't pay very much. There's more riskier assets such as junk bonds that pay more. So finding the rate of return on capital and then figuring out whether it's greater or less than the growth rate of GDP, that's also very, very problematic to do. What rate of return on capital do you use? Capital also includes plant and equipment. They have what's called different depreciation schedules according to most, uh, most tax systems. In other words, you don't take the full expense, write it off against your income in one year, you write it off uh, bit by bit. But even if we were to take his prescription and we would say, okay, when the rate of return on capital is greater than the GDP growth rate, uh, we're going to tax wealth to get it right. Say you have a recession and GDP goes down, GDP growth goes down. Do you really want to react to that by having a tax on wealth? I would say, no, you wouldn't want to do that. If there's a recession, the last thing you want to be doing is taxing capital. Quite the reverse. You want to be encouraging people to invest. You want to say, we want a short-term stimulus program, and what we want to do is uh, allow you to write off any capital investments, subtract them from uh, your total revenues uh, so that 
you encourage people to actually do additional investment. Further, taxing capital reduces returns for people who have assets in pension funds, and many people have assets that they don't even realize. Say that they are owed a pension from their employer, say they're a teacher, and there is a teacher's pension fund. The teacher's pension fund invests in this capital, and so taxing capital would reduce the earnings and the pension payouts of people when they come to retirement age. So for many, many reasons, uh, taxing capital is basically not a good idea, especially as a solution to reduced GDP growth. So if Piketty's solution uh, doesn't work, if uh, I don't think that Piketty has uh, much of uh, a case to make, what are some other solutions for reducing inequality? Well, one thing that we've heard about last night is trying to reduce the prices of products that all of you buy so that if you get a particular paycheck or a student stipend, you can buy more with it. And in the United States, we have large stores, large discount stores called Walmart and Target and Best Buy and Costco. These stores don't seem to be in Israel. At least I haven't found them. And it would be a lot better for all of you if you could go and shop at these discount stores. Or if you could go on Amazon.com and look for low budget items that would then get mailed, if the mail system were to work, directly to your house. Uh, so that would be one way of increasing your paycheck without you having to do anything, because it would go further. And one thing all of you should be doing is pressuring your government to allow these big discount stores here. If there's Walmart in Beijing and there's a French equivalent called Carrefour, why can't Walmart and Carrefour uh, be more predominant in Israel? There's no reason you shouldn't be able to have access to these stores. There isn't any reason you shouldn't have access to Amazon.com. 